It's good to be with you again. Uh, if your Bible's not already open, please take them up and open to the book of Esther. Uh, today's sermon will come from Esther chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. Well, in our study of the book of Esther, we have been witnessing the invisible hand of the God who was there through the free actions of sinful men and women to bring about his will for the good of his people and for his own glory. That's kind of been the reoccurring theme throughout the book of Esther, the providence of God, the unseen God who is there, faithful always to his covenant people. Now, last month, in our study, we witnessed the destruction of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And in a key reversal of the narrative, the one who possessed all power and all influence and all resources, this very man was hanged on the gallows that he had designed for Mordecai. Through this, we are reminded of God's great faithfulness to his covenant people, even in light of our unfaithfulness to him. We also see in Haman's destruction on the gallows that he had built for Mordecai a foreshadowing of Jesus' triumph over Satan and sin and death through the cross of Jesus Christ. I know this sermon series I've entitled The God Who Is There, but it could very easily be the gospel according to the Old Testament. Because on every page of this book, we are continually being pointed through types and shadows to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary on behalf of his people. But though the cross was designed to humiliate and to destroy the Son of Man, man it became the instrument of God's glory and the means of salvation for all who look with faith to Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. Well, in our text for today, we will further witness the Lord's reversal of the plot against his covenant people. And so I've broken my exposition of today's text down under three primary headings. First, in verses 1 through 2, we encounter a replacement within the executive. A replacement within the executive in verses 1 through 2. And then second, in verses 3 through 14, we'll explore the reversal of the edict. The reversal of the edict in verses 3 through 14. And then finally, in verses 15 through 17, we'll examine the result of the counter edict. The result of the counter edict. The replacement within the executive, the reversal of the edict, and the result of the counter edict. That's the outline. That's where I hope to go this Lord's Day by the grace of God. And so please take up your Bibles with me and please follow along as I read aloud and listen to the word of the Lord. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king. And she said, if it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. 
But you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. The king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day. And an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews to the satraps and the governors, to the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces to each province in its own script and to each people in its own language, and also to the Jews in their script and their language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service bred from the royal stud, saying that the, king, uh, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods. On one day throughout all the province, provinces of King Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. A copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province, being publicly displayed to all peoples, and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So the couriers, mounted on their swift horses that were used in the king's service, rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command, And the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, There was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday, and many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews, for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. People of God, this is the unfailing and errant word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we have come here hungry and thirsty for your righteousness. We have placed ourselves by faith under the ordinary means of grace that you have appointed for your glory and for the good of our souls. And so we ask, Father, that you would send your Holy Spirit to minister to us, to take this word that is proclaimed and to apply it to every heart and mind that is gathered here. Father, we pray that there would be nothing that would hinder us from hearing your word with faith and responding in faith with works of righteousness that bring honor and glory to your name. I pray, Father, that there would be nothing about your messenger this day that would hinder the message from finding its place in every heart. And I pray that by your grace, Father, that we would prove ourselves to be doers of your word and not simply hearers who delude ourselves. We ask above all else, Jesus, that you would be exalted in this hour through the preaching and the hearing of your word. I ask now, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. For, Lord, you are our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. We pray these things humbly in the good and precious name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, with Haman hanged on his own gallows for his impropriety and threats against the queen, we now read in verse 1 of chapter 8, On that day King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And when the author of Esther says that the king gave his queen the house of Haman, what he means to say is that Haman's estate and that his fortune and that even his own children became hers to do with as she saw fit. It was a common practice among the Persians 
and other rulers in this region and in this time to seize the property of those who were executed as traitors to the crown. In fact, the Greek historian Herodotus recorded that the property of an executed traitor reverted to the king who could dispose of it as he saw fit and at his will. And since Ahasuerus believed that his queen was the one wronged by Haman, the king bestowed the confiscated estate to Esther. This was seen as justice. But Haman's estate was so large that it was impractical for the queen to manage it. And so, picking up in the last half of verse 1, we read, And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. Now, you'll remember that in chapter 7, Esther had outed herself as a Jew. And now she has told the king of her family relation to Mordecai, who had five years earlier, you'll remember, saved the life of the king by reporting an assassination plot against him. And so the king called Mordecai into the court, and in verse 2 we encounter a replacement within the executive. That's our first point, a replacement within the executive. We read there in verse 2, And the king took off his signet ring and gave it to Mordecai, and Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. And so not only is Mordecai over the household of Haman, but by receiving the king's signet ring, in fact, the very ring that Haman had been previously given by the king, Mordecai now had been elevated to the position that Haman had held prior to his execution. And so now Mordecai is the prime minister of the empire and second only to the king. And we know that the signet ring was a sign of the king's trust and friendship. And as one commentator notes, quote, the bestowal of the signet ring conveyed legal authority to act on the king's behalf, end quote. And so through this replacement within the executive, we witness yet another reversal in the story of Esther. And you'll remember that reversal is one of the key themes in the book of Esther. God providentially reverses and overturns the sinful actions of human beings in order to produce his glory for the good of his people. And here we see a prime example. Haman's fall was followed by the rise of Mordecai, whom he had sought to destroy. Haman plotted. But providentially, Mordecai was rewarded with both Haman's position and his property. Well, it seems that providentially things have turned out very well for both Esther and Mordecai. But even though there has been a favorable replacement within the executive, Haman's decree concerning the destruction of the Jews is still in place. And so in verses 3 through 14, we need to explore the reversal of the edict. How is God going to reverse this irrevocable law of the Persians? And so I want to point out three facets of this reversal for us. Three facets for you note takers. First, in verses 3 through 6, we encounter Esther's request. This sermon is brought to you by the letter R today. I'm (laughs) just putting that there. Uh, Esther's request. Uh, Beginning in verse 3, we read, Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. When the king held out his golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king. Now, notice how This time, there is absolutely no hesitation with Esther in approaching the king in order to make her request. Earlier, she had been very tentative, and she had to be very strategic about how she approached the king. But now, in light of all that God has done, the reversals that have already occurred, we see an emboldened Esther. She now just comes into his presence and falls upon his feet, weeping over the fate of her people. And when the king extends to her the golden scepter, notice also that there is no delay 
in making her request. She's not saying, if it please you, king, come to a dinner that I'm going to prepare for you tomorrow, and I'll tell you what's on my mind. There's no more of that strategizing, the sort of intellectual, mental, cat and mouse going on. No, she's very, very direct. We read in verse 5, and she said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, Now notice that she is prefacing her request with a number of clauses, four to be exact. And you'll see in the first and third clauses, there we read, if it please the king, and if the thing seems right before the king, her focus is on his favorable consideration of the request that she is about to make. But the second and the fourth clauses And if I have found favor in his sight, and if I am pleasing in his eyes, these focus on the king's feelings for Esther. It's as if she's saying, know that I'm going to ask you for something very, very big. But if you love me, you'll you'll grant my request, even though it is a difficult one. Wives, take note. This is how you do it. Right? You appeal not only to our good, your husband's good nature, if he has one, <laughs> but also his love for you. I've got a big ask, honey. I know it goes against everything that you stand for. But if you love me, this is what we need to do. That's, that's the way that Esther is framing this. And then continuing... In verse 5, we discover her request. Let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all of the provinces of the king. So we see that her request is for the reversal of the edict that Haman had set out commanding the destruction of the Jews. Her desire is that the king would revoke the irrevocable law of the Persians. That's a big ask. Everyone knows that the, that the law of the king cannot be reversed, but that is exactly what she is boldly asking that the king do. And notice Esther's continued shrewdness in making her request. She does not in any way mention the king's name in association with the edict. Rather, she mentions only Haman's name, therefore making him solely responsible for the decreed genocide of her people. And in verse 6, notice that Esther's appeal is both personal and emotional, designed to tug on the heartstrings of Ahasuerus. She says to the king, For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred. She's tugging at his heartstrings, but she is not insincere. She is not manipulating him. She has completely identified herself with her people. And this has been a glorious progression throughout the book of Esther. First, she's like, I'm not a Jew. I don't know these people. I'm just going to go with the flow. But now she is so identified, even though her life has been spared, She cannot bear to live thinking that the welfare of her people is still in doubt. And so with great sincerity, she makes this extremely emotional appeal to her king. And this is one of uh, only two places in the whole book of Esther where Esther actually shows her emotions. The other, you'll remember, was back in chapter 4, verse 4, when after receiving news that Mordecai and the Jews throughout Susa were in sackcloth and ashes, mourning and lamenting Haman's decree, there we were told the queen was deeply distressed. And so in this very tenuous book where The fate of the Jews is always at question. Esther has generally played her position or her cards held closely to the vest. But here and then in chapter 4, verse 4, we see the true emotion of the woman 
for her people come out. Both times, the queen's emotions are displayed over her concern with the well-being of her people. And so, moved with compassion for the plight of her people, Esther requests from the king a reversal of Haman's edict. But second, in verses 7 through 8, we'll find the king's response. The king's response. We've already considered Esther's request, but now we'll find the king's response. Ahasuerus, confronted with the emotional pleas and request of the queen, gives his response, and there we read, Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they hanged him on the gallows, because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. Now, in essence, Ahasuerus' response to Esther's request was that he could not and he would not revoke Haman's edict, which was issued in his name and sealed with the ring. It's as if he's saying, well, you can write what you want, but I can't revoke what's already been written. So it's kind of almost like a, hey, be wise in how you write this. Because whatever is written in my name and sealed with my signet signet, uh, ring, this is an irrevocable statute within the empire. No matter how much the king may have wanted to help his queen by revoking Haman's statute, ultimately his hands were tied. For everyone knew that the law of the Persians and the Medes could not be repealed or revoked. But in denying a reversal of the original edict, Ahasuerus leaves a way open for Esther and Mordecai to counteract Haman's decree and to allow the king to save face. The third facet is found in verses 9 through 14 as Mordecai drafts a report, a report to the Jews. So armed with the king's blessing to write as they please and in possession of the king's signet ring, which will make whatever they write authoritative, we read beginning in verse 9, the king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, uh, on the 23rd day. And an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews, to the satraps and to the governors and of the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to each province in its own script and to each people in its own language and also to the Jews in their script and their language. Now, that may sound very familiar to you. I know I read it earlier, but... uh, If it's ringing a bell, it's because the language here in this chapter that we're considering is exactly parallel to the language in chapter 3, verse 12 and following when Haman industriously set himself to write his edict concerning the destruction of the Jews just two months earlier. The big difference is that Mordecai's edict is also written in the language of the Jews. And we also see in verse 10 that Mordecai used the royal delivery system to swiftly distribute his counter edict throughout the empire with the greatest possible speed. And this also parallels Haman's process in chapter 3. But it is in verses 11 through 13 where we find the substance of the report. And there we read, The king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather together and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods on one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. A copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree to all peoples and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. They could, Ahasuerus couldn't revoke his earlier precept and so by allowing Mordecai and Esther to write this, which is pretty much an undoing of everything that Haman had written, 
what he's actually doing is legalizing civil war within his empire, which is just amazing. Mordecai's report to the Jews and to all the inhabitants of the kingdom was a perfect counteraction or a counterreaction to Haman's evil edict. Haman's decree called for offensive action against the Jews, but Mordecai's report called for the Jews to take defensive action against those who would seek to do them harm. Haman's statute commanded non-Jews to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the, mo- of the 12th month. And Mordecai's report commanded the Jews to do the same to any who would seek to carry out Haman's command against them. Haman's edict encouraged the plundering of the Jews, and Mordecai's report allowed the Jews to plunder those who sought to kill them. And so one scholar, I think, helpfully commented, quote, according to Mordecai's edict, the Jews cannot go around killing and plundering whomever they like. They are permitted to fight only against those armed forces that attack them. Thus, Mordecai's edict perfectly counteracts Haman's edict and seeks to neutralize its effect. His report is a point-by-point reversal of Haman's edict. And verse 14 records, So the couriers mounted on their swift horses that were used in the king's service, rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. And although it is true that the Jews were a small minority within the empire, I think that news of Haman's dead corpse suspended on the gallows that he had designed for Mordecai and Mordecai's replacement of Haman as the king's prime minister were clear signs that there had been a reversal in the plight of the Jews. And the pagans of the empire, who always were watching for the signs of the times, could only conclude that the unseen God of Israel was there and fighting against all who opposed his people. And so we've encountered a replacement within the executive, and we've explored the reversal of the edict. Finally, in verses 15 through 17, we must examine the result of the counter-edict, the result of the counter-edict. And so how was Mordecai's counter-report received? Well, verses 15 through 17 provide four results. First, we witness Mordecai's public recognition his public recognition. The king had rewarded Mordecai's loyalty by promoting him to the position that Haman had held within the court. In verse 15, we see that his new station was publicly recognized. We read, Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white with a golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. Now, these garments and these colors, we know historically, were reserved only for the king and for his highest officials. You'll remember that when in chapter 6, Haman had dressed Mordecai in the king's robes and led him through the city square mounted on the king's horse, Mordecai was was honored for a moment. But now here in chapter 8, verse 15, he is publicly recognized as the king's prime minister. I think this is such a twist, isn't it? Before God's providential reversal, Mordecai had been wearing sackcloth and ashes as one humbled before God and men. But now, by the providential hand of the unseen God who is there, he has been clothed in royal raiment and recognized by all as the favored minister of the king. But second, we witness the city's restoration. The city's restoration. Previously, when Haman's edict was issued in chapter 3, verse 15, we observed the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. But now here in chapter 8, verse 15, as a result of Mordecai's counter-edict and his public recognition, we read, the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. shouted, and rejoiced. What a reversal in a very short amount of time. Order and happiness were restored 
to what had been chaos and confusion. The third, we witness reversal throughout the empire. Reversal throughout the empire. In response to Haman's edict, chapter 4, verse 3, records of the Jews, and in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great, uh, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting. But here now in chapter 8, verse 16, we read, the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. Four negatives are reversed into four positives. And the reversal throughout the empire is further elaborated in verse 17 where we read, and in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. You'll remember at Haman's edict, there was fasting and lamentation. But at Mordecai's counter edict, there is feasting and a holiday. What a radical reversal. And fourth and finally, we witness respect among the pagans. Respect among the pagans. Verse 17 closes, And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews, for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. Now, the Hebrew word here translated as declared themselves Jews, that's one word, but it's translated in English as declared themselves Jews. This word only occurs here in all of the Old Testament, so it's difficult to know exactly what the author is driving at. And many commentators have seen this as an indication that many of the pagans converted and joined themselves to Yahweh and his covenant people and certainly that is a glorious hope. But I must tell you that I feel about that school of thought kind of the way I feel about post-millennialism. That would be great if it were true. But like post-millennialism, I believe seeing the mass conversion of pagans throughout the empire in this text is more optimistic than realistic. In fact, one commentator notes on the pagans' fears of the, uh, of the Jews, quote, they had a law written by Haman, who was now dead, and a second law written by Mordecai the Jew, who now held the reins of power. It is surely rather the dread of the political and military power wielded by Mordecai and the Jewish community that prompts their profession, end quote. But whatever the meaning of their declaring themselves Jews was, what we cannot miss at the end of chapter 8 is that by the providence of the unseen God who is there, all has been reversed for the covenant people of the God of Israel. His invisible hand replaced Haman with Mordecai. His invisible hand reversed the edict that condemned the Jews to death. And his invisible hand of providence resulted in the restoration and respect of his people throughout the empire. So what do we learn from this text? And how can we be strengthened in the faith as a result of these radical providential reversals in chapter 8? Well, I, I came up with a lot of things, but I'm only going to leave you with two today. I hope you don't feel cheated. We can talk about a third one after. But two... The first one is this. Let us know and believe that God has reversed the cur curse of his law through the gospel of Jesus Christ for those who believe. I want us to see that clearly today. That God has reversed the curse of his law through the gospel of Jesus Christ for those who believe. Like Ahasuerus, whose law could not be revoked, our God and creator has written his unchanging law upon the hearts of all men by creating us in his image. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. We have the law of God written upon our hearts. We also have 
rational minds, that separates us from the animals, and we have souls that are made for eternity. But when we talk about the image of God, one of the primary things we're talking about is that we have the law of God written upon our hearts, and this is why the Apostle Paul can say in Romans chapter 1 that all men know that God exists and that all men are without excuse. Why? Because they're made in the image of God. They have the law of God on their heart. That's why missionaries can go to places that don't have radios or TVs or Bibles, and they can find indigenous people who are innately, naturally following the law of God, even though they don't give honor to God in the doing. They know intuitively that you don't steal, you don't lie, you don't commit adultery, you don't murder, you don't covet. Why? How is that possible? Because they're made in the image of God. They're made in the image of God, and that's why they have value. That's why all human beings have value. Whether we agree with them, whether we disagree with them, all human beings have intrinsic value. Why? Because they're made in the image of God, and the proof of that is that the law of God is written on, that, on their hearts. So the law of God on their hearts that not only gives them intrinsic value, leaves them without excuse for denying the reality of the one true God of heaven and earth. And so just as, as Jehoras' law could not be revoked, neither can God's law be revoked. God's law is universal and it is uncompromising in what it requires. It requires, it demands, it is worthy of nothing less than absolute perfect obedience in thought, word, and deed. And for any who transgress this law, the law of God, written on the hearts of men, for any who transgress that law, the irrevocable sentence is death, both physically and spiritually. This sentence of God's righteous wrath and curse hangs over the heads of all of the descendants of Adam, and because Adam, from whom we are all descended, failed, therefore his disobedience is counted to us all. His sinful nature is imputed to us and makes us guilty before God. Our attitudes and our actions of disobedience only further testify that we are indeed his offspring and therefore children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And that is absolutely the worst possible news that any human being can ever hear. But hearers, the glorious good news is that though God has not revoked his unchanging law that demands our just death and condemnation for our innumerable offenses against it, he has, through the gospel of his beloved son, Jesus Christ, issued a counter edict that leads to reversal, restoration, and eternal reward for those who believe. You see, the Father sent his only begotten Son into the world, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, so that he would be the perfect man, unmarred by the sin and failures of Adam. Without having his holy heart enslaved to sin, Jesus could and Jesus did Offer unto his God and Father perfect conformity and obedience to his irrevocable law. Rather than setting the law aside, Jesus fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law in the place of his covenant people. And as a perfect man who rendered perfect obedience, he gave himself as the perfect offering for the sins of his people. He suffered from the hands of men and from the holy justice of his heavenly father, the wrath and curse and agony that our sins have merited. But friends, on the cross of Calvary, Jesus satisfied his father's justice and he appeased his holy wrath. In fact, his dying words are, it is finished. Oh, those are the three most glorious words in the human language. It is finished. Finished. These words proclaim the sufficiency of his one-time substitutionary death. 
Nothing more must be. Nothing more can be added to his perfect sin-atoning, wrath-appeasing sacrifice. His resurrection on the third day in accordance with the scriptures proves that his sacrifice has been accepted by his God and Father. Therefore, all who look to him with faith, confessing uh, uh, their sins and repenting of their lawlessness, will be received and adopted by God to become his very own children forever. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5, the Apostle Paul testifies, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. That is the counter edict of the gospel. Jesus has done this. He has fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law, the very law that demands our death and our eternal damnation. And by being raised from the dead on the third day, we can absolutely know that our great enemies, Satan, sin, and death, have been dealt a lethal final blow. And that all who come to Jesus in faith, turning away from their ways of lawlessness and looking to Christ alone for the whole basis of their right standing before our Father in heaven, we can know that we are declared innocent, not guilty for the sake of Christ. Not because we're good people, but because Jesus is a greater Savior than we are sinners. And so, sinner, know that the law that cannot be changed condemns you to suffer God's wrath and curse, both in this life and the life that is to come. But, dear sinner, believe with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind that in the gospel which you just heard, God has counteracted his curse and reversed his wrath forever for those who join themselves to him through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. His irrevocable word to those who believe his gospel is this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So come to Jesus by faith today and be set free from the curse of the law and reconciled to God forever. The final application is this. Let us praise Christ for his perfect mediation and intercession. Let us praise Christ for his perfect mediation and intercession. Now throughout this sermon series in the book of Esther, I have endeavored over and over and over again to draw our attention to how Esther foreshadows and points us to Jesus Christ. I think that this is most clearly seen in her willing mediation between the king and the people of Israel. And so, beloved, please do not miss the parallels to our great high priest, Jesus Christ, in our text today. Just as Esther, full of compassion, pled with the king to reverse the edict of destruction that stood against her people, so too Jesus has pled and continues to plead for his Father's grace and mercy to be poured out upon his people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. In fact, on the night before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed to his Father for the faith and for the sanctification and for the perseverance of his people. Do you want to hear the real Lord's Prayer? Turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 17. I'm not dissing the Lord's Prayer. I'm just, Jesus taught us a formula by which to pray. When you pray, pray this way, right? These are the bullet points. Hit these things. But if you want to know how your great high priest intercedes for you and me who believe, John chapter 17 
This is the real Lord's Prayer. Beginning in verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, that is, the words of the upper room discourse in John's gospel, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, And you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know that in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you have sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one, while I was with them. I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world." I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, meaning the apostles. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and me. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I and them, and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Now that's a prayer. Jesus prayed for his people. He made intercession before he went to the cross. And the author of Hebrews tells us that he always lives to make intercession on behalf of his people. 
The author of Hebrews tells us that unlike the high priests of the old covenant who all died and who could not continue their mediation for the people, Jesus, who has been raised from the dead, never to die again, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. His nail-pierced hands and thorn-pierced brow at the right hand of the majesty on high speaks a better word than the blood of bulls and goats or of righteous Abel. For Christ's sake and for his sake alone, the Father is pleased to forgive all those whom Jesus represents and to pour out upon them the riches of his mercy and grace. And so we must glory in the resurrected Son of God and his ongoing intercession on our behalf. It is to him whom we must sing with joy and with humility and with great gratitude before the throne of God above. I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever bids and pleads for me. Friends, in our Christian walk, we continue to sin. We stumble, don't we? We fail to live as love demands. But Christians, our hope and peace in this life does not come from our efforts to do better. Our hope and peace comes from Jesus' continual, unfailing intercession with his God and Father on our behalf. And this does not mean that we who believe continue on in sin so that grace may abound. May that never be. That's stinking thinking. That's cheap grace. No, beloved. We are to be holy as the God who called us to himself is holy. But the intercession of our great high priest assures us that the good work begun in us by grace will be completed. Brothers and sisters, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, We thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And it is by your spirit working through the word that we are sanctified and brought into greater conformity with our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for not leaving us to ourselves. Though we are made in your image, though we have your righteous law written upon our hearts. Father, we, by nature, are Adam's children. We stumble, we fall, we fail. But we thank you, Father, that you did not leave us in that state, in that hopeless estate. But at the right time, when we were far from you, you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to step into the muck and mire of human existence, into the world that he created, to live a life of perfect obedience, to perfectly fulfill the righteous requirement of the law in our place, to give himself as a perfect, sin-atoning, wrath-appeasing sacrifice upon the cross of Calvary in our place, to become a curse for us. 
to die the death that we deserve under your irrevocable law. To be laid in the tomb and to be raised to life everlasting on the third day in accordance with the scriptures so that we can truly know that it is finished, that we can cease striving and know that you are God. Father, we thank you for our great high priest and for his ongoing intercession on our behalf. Jesus, you are our only hope. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for taking your word and applying it to our hearts, to renewing our minds so that we may see and savor our beloved Savior high and lifted up. Father, we ask that you would teach us to walk in the ways of the newness of life that is ours through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. We ask this all for the sake and in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.